I'm Laura Skocek. I'm hosting the webinar for Klaus today. Uh, Klaus is the author of Triple Benefit Principle. It's his scientific research and also a film we did together. And um, this is his first webinar that we are hosting through this Facebook page about the Triple Benefit Principle. And please let me point out some things for you, uh, how this is going to take place. Uh, we are recording the webinar. We also live stream to Facebook in case someone cannot join anymore. And uh, by participating, you also agree that uh, your personal image is transmitted and that we can reuse it just for educational purposes, you know, so we can keep the video published on Facebook. And uh, I would also ask you to keep your cameras and your microphones turned off, which you're already doing. Thank you very much. And uh, now let me introduce Klaus to you. So he's um, the inventor of the triple benefit principle, as I said. Uh, just let me. Yes, I just have to admit our new guests in between, sorry. So after studying medicine and cultural anthropology, Klaus worked as a doctor and researcher in Congo, in Paraguay, and in Austria. He is the author of about 40 publications in the field of medicine, cultural anthropology, disarmament, sustainable development, and global health. And now retired from his clinical work, he continues lecturing at three universities. He also published in Global Health. And may I say that uh, to many, the combination of his personal experience and his research in sustainability is a great inspiration. Um, the first part of his presentation includes facts about triple benefit principle, data about planetary boundaries, greenhouse gas emissions and climate change, and practical experience and data about sustainable living with focus on sustainable transport and mobility management. Uh, afterwards, or also already in between, we will have a short discussion of the comments and questions uh, sent to Klaus in the chat. Yes, so may I just... I will turn the video off for one participant, sorry. Because we're starting the presentation now and Klaus will begin sharing his slides in a minute. Please, Klaus. Thank you, Laura, uh, for this nice welcome and welcome to everybody. I'm very happy to hear that uh, we have participants uh, from all over the world. And uh, I will start my presentation immediately. I include a little bit from my personal history in the beginning. So, maybe you are surprised if I start with a picture from Paraguay in 1979. I was working there and what you see in this picture is displaced persons. Why are they displaced? The reason is land grabbing. You might know that big areas of land were sold and are being sold continuously in many countries of the world. And this land is not only taken away from the indigenous people, it is used uh, for planting soybeans, for uh, planting sugar cane, uh, for as grassland uh, to get cattle in. And this is a serious uh, global problem. Wood is extracted, precious wood is sold, and this is what remains from what once was a beautiful rainforest. So what I learned in Latin America in my years is that deforestation leads to land degradation and to climate change. It's about 20% of the reason for climate change is coming from deforestation and land degradation. About 80% is coming from fossil fuels. That uh, this is a loss of natural carbon sinks, a loss of biodiversity, and of course, it leads to social and economic destruction of an almost 100% sustainable society with a circular economy. So in the picture above here, you can see this is what once was forest and uh, now is used as agricultural land 
at a large scale. And in the second picture underneath, you see uh, the traditional economy of indigenous people planting maize. And you can imagine all is done by hand and by foot, no machine and uh, footprint practically zero. This is a really circular economy, 100% sustainable. As a doctor, I used to say climate change is just a symptom of the disease. The disease is much larger. The disease is behind. We will come back to that later, but climate change is one important system. What I learned is that there is a need for a transformation of Western lifestyle. We cannot go on like this, exploding the globe. And when I ask myself, what can I do? So let me think of Mahatma Gandhi, be the change you want to see in the world. So everybody of us can start this change. In the first part of this presentation, I would like to talk mainly about housing consumption and transport, because these are the three areas uh, which produce our footprint and our carbon footprint. So this is how, what makes our contribution uh, to climate change and also to land degradation, loss of biodiversity, etc. For housing, I put this nice picture. It's a house in Congo uh, in the, among the tribe of the Asande where I have been, done research in the 70s and I have been co-working in the construction of this house and I have been living there uh, later also with my wife. And uh, uh, this house, if you have a look on that, and maybe many of you know houses of that style, they are not only in Africa, they are in many places. It's a 100% sustainable house. Now, when we talk about architecture, we have to rethink if you want to continue using concrete. We have to think of the life circle uh, of all the material. Uh, Finit, for instance, is an alternative to concrete, but there are also other uh, constructions. The second uh, issue uh, we have to think is consumption and consumption is not only nutrition. Nutrition is very important that we try to have a sustainable nutrition, but it, consumption is also all our goods we use, uh, our computers, our mobile phones, uh, anything we have at home, uh, any instruments and machines we use, and of course they have big footprints. And the th third chapter is transport. And uh, for me, transport and the question of sustainable transport was a key experience. Let's start with nutrition. You know, from a medical point of view, the healthy eating plate consists of enough liquid, lots of vegetables and fruits, whole grain and healthy protein. Not necessarily meat, but healthy protein. And I guess most of you know uh, slides or tables uh, like this with the high bars for the carbon footprint of beef and cheese and uh, medium uh, bars for the footprint of poultry, eggs, dairy products, and then the very low footprints uh, of uh, all vegetables and fruits if they are locally uh, produced and seasonally consumed. Uh, in addition to that, I want to show you a very interesting uh, graph. It's rather new and it shows that even within the area of beef, you may find a wide range of footprints. Of course, the average is about 25 kilograms of carbon dioxide per 100 grams uh, of beef, which is uh, pretty high. It's mainly because of the methane uh, uh, production uh, of uh, all uh, ruminants. Uh, but under certain conditions, the footprint can be lower, especially if the cattle is kept in grassland, uh, if uh, the cattle uh, contributes to binding carbon in the ground, etc. 
So you see that lamb is, is almost equally high, and then we come to cheese and pork, chicken and eggs, which has, let's say, a medium footprint, and at the lower end, you find again all uh, the vegetables, etc. Now you might ask, well, what's about nuts? It's in the negative uh, range. Yes, in fact, nuts can have a negative range. It is nuts uh, that grow on trees because uh, as long as carbon is, uh, uh, is uh, taken from the growing wood, then uh, carbon dioxide is taken out of the air. And so a nut plantation can even have a negative footprint. Of course, the main question remains what's happening with the wood afterward. As soon as uh, the wood is burned, uh, then we come close to zero again. But this to have an overview about the importance of how sustainable or non-sustainable uh, our nutrition is. And now I want to give you two examples already from the low range. I want to compare eating bread and eating potatoes. Both are important carbohydrates for our health and both are vegetarian products. So have already a very low footprint, but still we can have an enormous difference uh, the in, uh, dependent from how our meals are prepared from wheat or from potatoes. Let's go through the life cycle of a piece of bread. You know, uh, in traditional uh, farming or in, uh, in machine farming, they start with preparing the field and then uh, they use pesticides, herbicides, uh, they use uh, artificial fertilizer, then comes the harvester machine. And then the uh, harvested uh, wheat has to be transported by any means of transport to the mill. And then uh, from the mill, uh, the, uh, it, it, it needs to be transported and again by a means of transport to the bakery, the flour. And then we arrive at the bakery, of course, a modern bakery wouldn't like any more like this. I have seen many uh, bakeries uh, of that style, uh, they are sustainable as long as the wood is harvested sustainably. So you see you have a long upstream chain of preparation, still we have the ready-made brain, brain, uh, bread, and even you have to add your footprint if you go, for instance, to the supermarket or to shop to buy the bread, if you use the car to go there, then you can add the footprint of uh, your car and the transport footprint can be pretty high. Now about potatoes, if you, or vegetables. You may plant potatoes if you have a garden or you have, uh, let's say, an organic farmer nearby, you can buy organically produced potatoes, vegetables, etc. from there, so the footprint without transport, without further technical processes is practically zero. And if you are lucky to have a solar cooker, this is my solar cooker, then you don't even need electric energy uh, for cooking. So uh, the overall uh, footprint of this uh, vegetarian meal is almost zero. This just as an example to understand. And as I said, the transport of our food plays an important role. It can be enormously high. We will talk about this when we come to transport. Now, if we have a look on our supermarkets, we should know that 70 to 90% of all our food is processed food. So there is a long complicated footprint of all kinds of processes in production, in many transport, in pot, packaging and so on. We should think of that when we want, uh, when we talk uh, about sustainable nutrition. Now the next is transport and this was really uh, for me a very interesting experience because from 1983 till 2011 I was working as a family physician in a rural community in Austria. So um, 
maybe some of you have seen the film. Uh, it's a 15 minutes uh, short uh, film awarded in almost all continents of the world about triple benefit principle. There you can observe uh, and see uh, my history. But now I just give you data. So uh, one day I discovered that my footprint of transport was very high. I had reduced the footprint of housing. I had banned all fossil fuels from my household already in 83 in refusing oil heating for my uh, house. It was not my house. I didn't own it. I rented it from uh, the community, but I refused that they made the oil heating in the house. And uh, then I had already, I was living on an almost completely vegetarian diet. So this was not the problem for my footprint. The problem was the 30,000 kilometers I was traveling as a physician in a rural uh, community without public transport. So in the 90s, I started to get interested in footprints of different means of transport. And in general, I guess many of you know it, uh, we can say the plane and the car are the bad ones with the high footprints and of course trains and cycling and walking and sometimes also buses have the lower footprints. This is international data from BBC and this is Austrian data. It says about the same. You see on top, I'm sorry that I have this only in German, but you can see here that the bicycle with only one gram per 100 kilometers and the Austrian railway with electricity from water power are rather clean means of transport. And then on the other hand, we have the planes and the cars with very high footprints. Uh, if it is about transporting goods, we have similar uh, data. Uh, of course, uh, transporting Consumer goods by air freight has an enormous high footprint. We should avoid this and we should think of it when we buy a good that it has not arrived in our country by air transport. Road transport is already cleaner or has lower footprints. Rail is even better and the best, best of course, is shipping the lowest footprint. Now about cars, I meet more and more colleagues or people here in Europe they say, well, anyway, I will buy an electric car and then I will go by zero emission. This is an illusion. You know, I show you data from the Fraunhofer Research Institute in Germany. And they did a lot of research about footprints of electric cars. If you uh, have a look on this graph, it goes over a life cycle of 13 years. The production of the car at the beginning of course, in the beginning, the electric car uh, emits more, or the production of the electric car emits more carbon dioxide because there is uh, the battery, mainly lithium batteries. Uh, and, but then over the year, the electricity consumption is, uh, or the emission from electricity is lower than the emission uh, from gas or from diesel. But, all the medium lines here, they show what is reality in Europe. At the very end, you might have shrunk the footprint by about 50%. If you have in all upstream processes really renewable energy, but you cannot influence all this, as some of these processes happen in other countries, you do not have an influence on what kind of machines they use in mining for lithium, etc. So uh, under best conditions, you might come down to a quarter. So don't think that you are going zero emission when you drive an electric car. The footprint might be lower than in a conventional car. But if we know the goal of coming to zero emission by 2050, then we know exactly that shrinking down to only a quarter of our emissions in the transport sector is not enough. Therefore, for me, it is clear that the main substitute for a car must be the bicycle, if the distance is long or if you cannot walk it. And there is a second problem with electric cars. 
You know, people say, yes, I would probably buy an electric car, but I do not want to charge electric fuel to charge my battery every 200 kilometers. But what you can see here, the larger the battery, the closer you come to the same amount of emissions as in conventional cars. So this is a real handicap for an electric car. Of course, technology might still improve, but what is the reality now is not yet what we need in the reduction of emissions. Now here, this graph is from my personal history. As I told you, it was in 1995 when it was clear to me that I have to change something in my transport behavior. With 30,000 car kilometers in the beginning, I thought that I have to struggle very hard. Maybe I can get them down to 15,000 kilometers. I will use more bicycle to visit my patients in my home, uh, to go for, to town whenever I need, and I will combine bicycle and train. I thought I would have to struggle very hard, but in fact, it was easy. Very soon I came down to 15,000. And then I get, got more interested and I discovered that you can reduce even more, but you have to develop an individual transport list logistics. So finally, by the year 2007, I came down to below 2000 kilometers. All other kilometers I did by train and mainly by bicycle, over 10,000 kilometers I cycled every year. So my footprint shrank enormously. You can see this story in the uh, Triple Benefit Principle short film. So I learned a lot of that about logistics. And I also, in this time when I developed Triple Benefit Principle between two, uh, 1996 uh, and 2007, I learned a lot and in the years uh, from my first publication in 2006 to 2011, I received several awards. I have developed a learning game with the ESO emission cubes. This is one of these ESO emission cubes uh, from the learning uh, game mobility, where people really can train scenarios how to get their own transport patterns uh, to a more sustainable level. Let me just uh, give a short overview of what I consider important from this uh, very exciting experience over more than 10 years. So the basics are, if it is a short distance, walk or cycle, never use a car. If it is a long distance, take your bike to the railway station, to the next railway station, if it is between five and kilometers, so this is uh, between 15 and 30 minutes, this should not be a problem, and then continue by train. I use a folding bike so I can fold my bicycle. It is a piece of luggage in the train, and then when I arrive uh, at my destination, I unfold my bike and I can continue on bicycle, so I can live without a car now. Now, if you have an appointment late in the night, try to change the time if you are afraid of going home by bicycle when it is dark and when it is late night. If you have to go to shopping, primarily do it by bicycle. Try to combine your ways uh, with ways for your work. Uh, you have to do anyway. If the commuting distance is too long, consider teleworking, at least on a few days. If everything is too far, try to move to another place. And that's what I also did for family reasons. Not all is possible, but a lot is feasible. So I have developed these mobility games. I did more than 100 mobility workshops, but I cannot go into details now. On the other side, I would like to present you a few data from a large research I did in 2014. You see that car in Rich countries, cars are used too much, even in low income people, but more in middle and in high income people, more than half is used for a private purpose and less than half is used for work. If I asked people 
in this questionnaire, what is the distance from your home to your workplace? The average distance is below eight kilometers. So this is a distance you can easily go on bicycle. And it even has the advantage that you contribute to your personal health if you regularly use your bicycle. Of course, it could be raining and so on, but there is rain protection, uh, clothes, etc. People who live in their own homes have a little longer distance, but even 10, 11 kilometers. I did 17 kilometers from home to job for many years, one distance. And people who live in shared apartments, of course, they have only a few kilometers in general from work to home. I asked also people if they would be able to reduce car kilometers. And interestingly, people who are working in research and development, this is the first bar, are uh, in general said that they are able to reduce uh, by more than a half. Only people, farmers, people in agriculture, they also see a possibility to reduce uh, their transport, uh, but not to 50%, a little less. And as a doctor, I have to mention the health. Now, many people understand that the movement on the bicycle, the body movement is very healthy. So individual health, uh, there are many reasons. I show you some uh, details. This is quite clear. But not many people think that if I cycle, it's also good for the health of my neighbors because I produce less dust, less noise, I pollute less, I pollute uh, with my car. And you know, uh, the exhaust of diesel, for instance, is carcinogenic, is producing cancer. So also for the neighborhood's health, we contribute to it. And global health, we also do something globally because especially poor people and poor people in global south are those who are most suffering from the consequences of climate change. So if we reduce our carbon footprint, we also contribute to a diminishing of these problems. For personal health, just a few data. If you do cycling on a regular basis, you risk, you reduce your uh, risk for cardiovascular dis uh, disorders, for diabetes, for osteoporosis, for breast cancer, for colon cancer, for gallstones, etc. So there are a lot of health benefits. And my thesis about these health benefits has been confirmed by independent research in the later years. Now, uh, scientists talk about the so-called health co-benefits for climate change. Well, that's exactly what I already expressed in the first years of triple benefit principle. And WHO Europe has published the so-called health economic assessment tool for cycling. In short, it teaches us that if we do a regular body movement for about six hours a week, we can achieve a maximum of health benefit, and this is considerably high. If we do double, so two hours per day, there is not much difference for health. So one hour per day or six hours per week is the optimum. And therefore I say, if you have eight kilometers from your home to your workplace, you are the happy one. If you do it on the bicycle, you do best for your health. So this is a little bit about literature. Uh, scientists have also studied the economic value of, cy of cycling, but I cannot go into details. Uh, I want to show you a few pictures from my personal experience on transport uh, on a bicycle. You see transporting even larger pieces is possible. Uh, traveling, I did many holidays uh, on bicycle together with my wife. I will come back to that later. Uh, even in winter, you see the skis are on my bicycle uh, to go for skiing, uh, transporting a Christmas tree, transporting mattresses, transporting fruits, or transporting larger things. It's all possible. Or here, maybe you can see it on the picture. I like to play the cello. 
uh, so the cello is on my bag when I go to a chamber music uh, course uh, during summertime. All this is possible on a bicycle. It is just that people do not often think of this. And about holiday without car and plane, I'm the lucky one to have more than 40 year experience of wonderful holidays together with my wife uh, in almost all European countries, sometimes combined uh, with lectures I gave at various uh, universities. So all these were holidays without car and without plane. In 2014, I was invited to lecture a seminar at the Earth Institute of Columbia University in New York. So to avoid plane travel, I traveled on this cargo ship. This is uh, when I arrived in Chester near Philadelphia after crossing the ocean during 14 days. I started in Antwerp and uh, you see the containers up there and now I'm happy to leave the ship. Here you see my folding bike. I unfolded it and in three and a half days I arrived in New York. Now let's talk about money. What's the overall cost of one kilometer travel? And you see there is a big difference between car travel and bicycle travel or train travel. Although some people might have guessed that the bicycle is cheaper. I did a lot of calculation. I invite you to do your own calculation for a bicycle kilometer, but also a bicycle needs to be bought, it needs, to, needs repair, etc. But nevertheless, uh, train and bicycle are much cheaper. So if you succeed shifting 10,000 kilometers from car to bicycle or to train, you can save a lot of money. And the crucial question is, what are you doing with the money? As you have to invest sustainably, otherwise, you have a rebound effect, you will use the money for other goods, and then you produce again a big carbon footprint uh, in the factories where your luxury goods are produced. So I decided to invest this saved money into projects in sustainable development and especially in the provision of renewable energy in my own country, because there I am consuming energy. And this graph shows you that your personal footprint and the personal energy consumption goes down over the years, the better you are trained in triple benefit principle. And on the other hand, in the moment when you start cycling or using train instead of car, uh, you save money. And if you invest this money, the money gets more and more year by year even the amount per year is increasing as you see in this line and it comes more and then after about 10 years the two lines cross because you have already produced so much uh, renewable energy with your shares so i with my shares on wind energy solar energy plants etc in austria the same amount of energy that i consume now guess how much energy you consume. You will be, will be surprised in industrial countries like Austria, the overall gross energy consumption per capita is 45,000 kilowatt hours per year. So don't only think of the energy of the electricity in your own home, it's much more, it's all the public infrastructure, it's the energy for all machines, for the schools, for universities, for hospitals, etc. This makes our big footprint. So I call this meeting point the energy break even point. This is very important and I always used to invite people do the calculation for your country and for your person and see how you can reach this energy break even point the moment when you are able to provide the same amount of clean renewable energy that you consume as a citizen. Therefore, I call this triple benefit principle. And what does it mean? You see, the bicycle stands for a sustainable lifestyle because in my experience, cycling had the biggest effect. Of course, housing and nutrition is also very important, but I could not save that much money from housing and nutrition. And I could not, so I could not invest so much money in renewable energy. 
and I also could not my, reduce my footprint that much how I could do it by cycling. So our goal is a change in lifestyle, a circular economy, reuse, recycle. And this gives you the benefit of health, individual health, local health and global health. And you also have savings and you can invest these savings sustainably as I have just explained. As I said, it's not only about cycling. I give you an example for triple benefit principle from meat consumption. You can also have the three benefits. If you consume less meat, you reduce your cardiovascular and other health risks. You, uh, uh, cardiovascular diseases, even cancer is less if you consume less meat. It is cheaper and you can invest in a sustainable way. So for my wife and me, it was very important not to eat meat from factory farming because we do not want to be a part in this supply chain which destroys our globe, which leads to deforestation and to enormous social and cultural problems. Another example for triple benefit principle, the clay oven. You know, as I've been working in Latin America and in Africa, uh, this is a very important experience. On the left side, uh, you see uh, people, and this is mandioca, and uh, they have the open fire in the house. So the open fire needs more wood. If you have uh, a clay oven, less wood, you have better health, and also the cost is lower, and there are several more benefits. So also in nutrition and in housing, you can find these triple benefits principles. And in one of my university, in a seminar I hold for uh, engineers, uh, I even invite people to discover these elements in the supply chain of their products, which reduce footprint, improve health, and cost less at the same time. It's a work we have to do with our brain. You know, we have to think a little bit out of the box. So this was my first time and I am ready to answer uh, questions that have arised. On the, I arrived on the chat. Uh, Laura, may I ask you to tell me what kind of questions we have? Sure, Klaus. We have three questions to you. Um, I think one of the participants who posed the first questions is already gone but uh, he wanted to know if you have any tips for rooftop gardening for beginners? It depends from the country and from the climate, you That's know? Uh, but um, I'm not, in, my wife is much better gardener than I am. <laughs> so, uh, but there are a lot uh, what, uh, what you can do. I would say start uh, with simple things, with vegetable, with tomato, uh, maybe potatoes if you have a much uh, enough land, you know, um, and fruits, of course, nuts, as you see, nuts can even have a negative footprint, yeah, if it's nuts from trees. And uh, you can uh, make or uh, prepare your own uh, organic fertilizers uh, with the remnants uh, of your meals. Thank you. Um... That's very helpful, I think. Uh, we also have uh, on our Facebook page, a community page where you can share your experiences and where you can help each other. And uh, we have another very good question from Seka. He wanted to know, uh, as we know that soil sustainability is one of the most important things to provide food security and food production. If there is any simple way to a conventional farmer in a small village to prevent soil degradation? Oh, <laughs> I'm That's sure there specific. are several ways, uh, but this is not uh, my expertise, you know, I'm not in agriculture, uh, but I know that there are several uh, universities who are researching in that. Uh, it is uh, Witzenhausen in Germany, uh, uh, there are, it is uh, Boku University in Vienna, and uh, there is a lot of papers about that, uh, but I'm sorry, I'm really not a specialist in agriculture. 
Yes, maybe we can share some of the links later on. Um, and then there was a question from Dr. Baba, I think. Um, and I'm not sure if I understood it right. He wrote something like, is climate change just a symptom of the disease? Mm -hmm. Or maybe he can elaborate. I think he's, he's here. So I, I'm not really sure how the question was meant. Yeah, but I think I will answer this question in the second part. Okay. Uh, when I talk it's about planetary general, yes. boundaries, and uh, when I demonstrate that uh, climate change is uh, related to many other problems we have on our globe. I will focus on that in the second part. Also, Klaus, we have someone raising their hand, so this is also possible here. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, so I would put him uh, on loudspeaker, if you don't mind, and if Suresh Chandra Gupta doesn't mind to be live streamed on Facebook, I would ask him to uh, unmute his microphone and ask you the question. Let's see if this works. I think. Hello. Yep. Can you, we can hear you a little bit, I think. It's, it's okay to talk. You're on loudspeaker. Mr. Gupta, yeah, I hope I'm... Oh. Okay, so I can't hear him right now. So maybe we do this, we try again. Maybe after in the, the second part of the discussion. Yeah. After yeah. The so part. sorry if it's not working right now, I will mute it again. And uh, we have another question in the chat. So this one just came in. Um, I will just read it out. In this time of pandemic, sustainability of food is very vital. What ways and means can you suggest to promote food sustainability in schools? Yeah, that's specific, yeah. <laughs> thank you for this question. This is really an important question. As uh, in school, children are educated uh, uh, how to nourish themselves and uh, what is good food. So I would say the same guidelines as I presented in the beginning, you know, the basic of food should be locally produced, vegetable, fruit, full grain products, nuts, enough liquid, but not all this sugar bottle uh, drinks uh, we can buy here in the supermarket, you know, they have big footprints, lots of sugar, which is not healthy. And then you have a lot of waste uh, from the bottles. Yeah, locally seasonal, uh, locally produced uh, seasonal food. I think that's the basic. It depends from the country. And there are traditional ways of storing food. You know, we can uh, store carrots over the winter. There are certain uh, species of apple we can store, or store over many months. Pumpkins can be stored over many months and it is an almost zero footprint nutrition. Mm -hmm. Then there is another question. Um, it's very similar to this one actually and it's about organic kitchen garden gardens. Um, also during our time of the pandemic. Uh, what do you think is the future scope of organic kitchen gardens or farming? Yeah, I think it has a big future. We see that in many cities, uh, vertical gardening is starting. People want to have their own products. Uh, they want to have organic products. And uh, it is an art uh, to get out uh, many calories from a small, small area of land, uh, but it is possible. I think it has a big future and I recommend to start uh, with things uh, which are easy. Mm -hmm. And then there is one question about cycling with children. And uh, the question is, how did you transport your children when they were too little to ride their own bicycle? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, uh, we have three children, uh, two own and one adopted child. And uh, I transported up to two children on children's seats on my bicycle. 
and uh, when they were later, uh, they had their own bicycles. We did uh, holidays on bicycle. Of course, you cannot uh, go over 100 kilometers in a day with children, uh, but many things are possible. Very good. So I think that's it for the first round of questions. Okay, thank you very much, Laura. So I am ready to come to the second part. And now I have a question for you. Uh, how much energy do you think we need for a good life? So it's a question I give you for you. We cannot answer. It's a very complex question, but I am convinced that we could have a good life which much less energy than what's actually consumed in industrial countries. And of course, it should all come uh, from renewable sources. So from water, hydropower, uh, or from wind, uh, wind turbine, electricity, solar panels, uh, also a sustainably harvested uh, wood uh, is a, a sustainable energy source but be careful in using a crop plant uh, for uh, fuel for cars, then we will have a problem uh, with uh, nourishing uh, our global population. So I invite you to collect information, to collect data about this in your own country. I learned a lot uh, by collecting data in my country. So, to give you an overview, the world's primary energy till now is more than uh, 75, it's almost 80, it's about 80% 80 fossil. So coal, oil and gas together make the big part and we have to get rid of that. You know, coal, oil and gas are producing greenhouse gases and we should stop this as quick as possible. Only the smaller part is coming from biofuels and from waste, hydropower, 4% is nuclear, but nuclear energy will not save us. It will create many other problems. And uh, then we see it's a growing share, which is wind energy. It's already much larger now, uh, solar energy, etc. So we have to think how to get rid of these uh, fossil energy resources if we compare European countries. So the average is still not very good. The average is only 20% renewable energy, but there are some countries like Sweden and Finland, they have over 40 or Sweden even close to 60% of renewable energy in the whole countries. Austria has about one third renewable, two thirds non-renewable energy. So also for my country, it is a big uh, challenge, uh, this energy transformation. And uh, Luxembourg is on the lower end of this uh, graph. I will not go into de detail uh, with climate change. I guess you have basic information about the problem, but this graph shows how much carbon dioxide we have already produced over the years from 1900 to present time. And you see how far we have to come down if we want to stick to the two centigrade degree according to the Paris Agreement. So really we have to rush and we have to invent a new lifestyle if we want to get around this curve. Or in, in another graph uh, uh, by Robbie Andrews, he allowed me to show you, this is very interesting. You see, the longer we wait with our economy, with our uh, conventional economy, the faster we have to come down towards zero in order to not stress the world too much and the climate too much, there are already too many people suffering from climate change. Now, as we have this heat threat, stress in European countries, Europeans are more concerned, but we know from publications of United Nations that we had these problems. I just want to remember uh, the Human Development Report of 2007, uh, he explained how many millions of people are already suffering in poor countries from the consequences of 
climate change. So there is an urgent need for change in our economy. So if we use this graph, you see here is the year 2000. I started triple benefit in 96, triple benefit principle. So if everybody would have started this transformation process in 96, we would have come down slowly, slowly, maybe only 3% reduction in energy per year yeah but we have been waiting and waiting not taking serious these problems and even uh, being blamed uh, by climate change uh, deniers yeah and therefore we have high time to change our economic system right now and i am very happy about this i show these graphs also in all my seminars at my universities the famous planetary boundaries of Johann Rockström first uh, presented, published in 2009, then updated in 2015 and later. Uh, you can uh, find all this in the internet. What I want to show you is that it is not only climate change, which is a growing problem, it is at the same time uh, biodiversity. Biodiversity is a very serious problem. And it is also the use of chemical substances, especially artificial, artificial fertilizer. The nitrogen problem we have, which is a serious problem <coughs> in land and also contributed to climate, uh, to climate change via uh, the nitrous oxide and 2O. Then we have the acid, ocean acidification. This is also related to climate change. Yeah? because the more carbon dioxide enters the ocean, uh, the more we produce um, uh, carbon acid in the ocean, yeah? And uh, we have no volatilities. We have the ozone problem, which is partly solved. Meanwhile, this is a uh, good news. And we have aerosol problems, etc. And this all is interconnected. And I'm very glad that Johann Rockström presented this uh, uh, model. Uh, showing all these problems together and also trying to calculate this and to study the interdependence. Nevertheless, this model is only from a physical, chemical and biological point of view, but we need a wider view. As this model does not include aspects of wealth distribution, as the uneven wealth distribution on our globe is responsible for a lot of this problem. The model does not include, of course, social aspects of necessary transformation. It doesn't say anything about climate justice. It doesn't anything about disarmament, about learning from the wisdom of indigenous people. If you remember the Brundtland report, uh, this was in the time of Peres de Cuella, UN Secretary General. Uh, he in charge, uh, he invited uh, Grohal and Brundtland, you know, to preside this Brundtland Commission on, uh, on uh, Sustainable Development. And uh, if you read the report, you still find many words about the necessity of disarmament and necessity of learning from indigenous people who practice a circular economy, who practice sustainable lifestyle. This is often forgotten nowadays. It does not include consequences for our economy. How can a degrowth really work without suffering? Consequences for our daily life and work, for instance, less hours for work would be very useful. We profit more taking more time for cultural, for social activity, and not producing so many goods, which end up very soon in waste and are not really necessary for a good life. I'm talking, of course, in main line for industrial countries. This is not valid in the same way for poor people. And here, this just to illustrate the problems of the oils for war, you know, millions of people have been killed just for the reason that the rich countries get their fossil fuels. Who is responsible for this wrong development we have in our global civilization? 
we, everybody of us, every citizen, the government, the industry, the factory farmers, think of it, try to find your answer. From the side of politics, a carbon tax has been proposed so that the more carbon dioxide, the more greenhouse gas you produce, the more you have to pay tax. They have, and this tax can be invested in the provision of renewable energy in order to substitute fossil energy. So in principle, it's a good idea. The Council of the European Union proposed this according to the experience of Sweden in the year 1992. By the way, I published the article in London many years ago uh, in which I write about this. Uh, proposed uh, uh, carbon tax all over Europe. This law proposal was boycotted by lobbies from oil and car industry, etc. Meanwhile, we have more than 50 models of carbon pricing, carbon pricing, but they are rather weak. You know, we do not really see a change in the tendency. Greenhouse gases overall are not yet being reduced. Although we have imported voices in favor of, in favor of a carbon tax, like uh, UN Secretary General Antonio Gutierrez, uh, even Christine Lagarde from the International Monetary Fund, uh, Bloomberg, and to mention a uh, famous Austrian economist, Christoph Badel. You know, they all say we need a carbon tax, otherwise we will not get the curve. But be careful, maybe you have learned that in the United States, in Australia and in Canada, they have very high per capita carbon footprints. In the United States, it's over 16 tons per person and year. In Australia, it's even over 20 tons and in Canada, it's also very high. In the Gulf states, it's even higher in some places. And of course, uh, developing countries or global south countries have very low carbon per capita footprints. I guess you know all this. But if you listen that, for instance, a person in Sweden has only a carbon footprint of four or five tons of carbon dioxide, be careful. As we have outsourced a lot of production processes into other countries. So we buy goods from China, computer, technical products, toys, etc. So the footprint of these products is in the balance in the, uh, in the account of China. And I show you here data uh, from the European Union and you see, and including Switzerland and other countries, no, it's not only the European Union, it's globally. And you see that there are countries like Switzerland where they have an imported footprint of 200% of what is their own footprint. So Switzerland is very high, Hong Kong is very high, Singapore is very high, Sweden is very high, and even Belgium is very high. Other countries are low, and China, of course, has a negative because they export more. So if you read that a Swede in his country produces only 4.5 tons, you have to add of carbon dioxide uh, as carbon footprint in a year, you have to add 70%, you arrive at 7.65 tons carbon dioxide, but we know that we must shrink down to below one ton. Austria, officially we have about nine tons, but we have to add, an, add another four tons from imported goods we consume here, so we end up at 13 tons. And Switzerland, they declare only 4.73, tons per inhabitant, but they have to add 209% from imported goods. And in all these data are not yet included the emission from international freight and other international transport, from ship transport, and all the military, because you might know in the Paris Agreement of 2015, military emissions were not an issue. It was not talking about, it is not talked about, it is not included in all the Paris documents. 
In Austria, we had a special situation because the European Union refused our uh, climate proposal and then uh, several scientists uh, joined. Uh, they formed the Climate Change Center in Austria. And in 2019, they proposed a very attractive plan. I really think it's the best. And if you read the document, it's more than 200 pages, but it's worth to read. You will find many elements, you know, from triple benefit principle. They propose a tax reform, a carbon pricing, reduce subvention, you know, the Austrian government is directly or indirectly subventioning uh, fossil fuels uh, at an amount of four to five billions. Uh, uh, try to uh, make energy high efficient, move to a circular economy, yeah, ever heard? Uh, climate oriented spatial planning, you know, this is the land problem. We are sealing more and more land by constructing more highways, more highways. But we will need this land, especially in times of climate change, for food. We still, we can import food. But if we import food from poor countries, they will suffer more from it. Of course, we need an extension for, of renewable energy uh, and nature compatible carbon storage, you know, there are natural things, artificial things, etc. And education and research. Yeah. So that's why I 20 years ago, no, not 20, 18, eight, uh, 2006, 14 years ago, I developed this mobility game because I saw it is necessary that people learn to understand these uh, connections and facts. So the Austrian proposal, for instance, is to start with a carbon tax of 50 euros per ton. This would cost an Austrian uh, 50 times for inland, let's say nine tons, nine times 50 euros, makes 450 euros tax in a year, then growing up to 160, uh, 30 euros. But actually you should include imported, so another four tons, so another 200 euros. I think it is manageable, it is feasible, but it has to be done. And the state, the government is responsible that this tax money then is really invested into the provision of renewable energy or in other processes that reduce uh, the consumption of fossil energy, for instance, insulation of houses. This is very much important. Now let's compare these tax proposals. They generally go between 30 euros and up to 300 euros per ton of carbon dioxide, independent from the economists who proposed it. Let's compare it with the result of triple benefit principle. In my first year, I had already saved 1,000 euros easily by using bicycle more than car. So, and at the same time, I had already reduced my carbon footprint to 10 tons. So the money I invested in the provision of wind and solar energy was 100 euro per ton of carbon dioxide. You can say it is an equivalent. We didn't have a tax, a carbon tax, but I voluntarily invested it like this. So it is an equivalent, a useful equivalent to a carbon tax. But let's go on, this was only the beginning. A year later, I had already saved 2,000 and invested, invested in again. This was from 1996 to 2010, over 15 years, and I went on doing this. So then uh, it was already 200 euros per ton. And then it was 3,000 and my footprint had come down to eight ton because when driving less car, your footprint goes down. Yeah, so my overall footprint was smaller, but my investment was larger, as you have seen in these crossing curves I have shown you before. Before, so it was my uh, contribution was also three hundred was already three hundred and seventy five tons of carbon uh, per ton of carbon dioxide, and in my best years, my footprint had come down, shrank down to. 6.5 tons, 
but I had saved 6,500 euros easily by organizing my mobility, by managing my transport in a sustainable way. So this is an equivalent, this corresponds yeah, to a tax of 1,000 tons of carbon dioxide. So it's even more than the most critical economists demand. I want to give you an example to understand what I mean by triple benefit principle. Last year, Norway published in the media proudly that they have lots of electric cars, electric ferries, etc. cetera, that uh, uh, even some electric planes. But how was all this financed? Not in the way triple benefit principle does finance the provision provision of renewable energy. It was financed by the money Finland gains from oil and gas exports. So let's say the mechanism is to sell more oil and gas in order to make one's own economy more sustainable. So this is not a good idea. You know, as somebody will burn this oil in machines, in cars, etc. And on the other hand, I want to show you much earlier in 2010, I published an article in Glocalist Review. You can find it even in the internet. And I literally wrote, oil companies facing coming energy transition are about to extract and sell as much oil as possible in order to invest the assets in sustainable future projects. The consequences are catastrophes like in the Mexican Gulf, you remember the explosion of Deepwater Horizon, and high greenhouse gas emissions. Triple benefit principle follows a different and a more efficient, a more effective path. The immediate reduction of fossil energy consumption to a minimum and the investment of therapy achieved savings not the gains from selling oil, into the provision of renewable energy and in further carbon reducing or carbon binding projects. Through the targeted, implement, targeted implementation of cycling, besides of ecological and economic benefits, there are large health gains for the common good. These gains can now be assessed by the health economic assessment tool I showed you before. So I hope this is understandable, what I tell you. It makes an enormous difference. And it is important to understand the mechanism, how triple benefit principle works. In reality, we need a very rapid divestment globally from fossil energy, from fossil fuels. It has started, but it is not yet enough. Global fossil fuels is still subsidied by $5.3 trillion every year. In Austria, it's four to five billion euros. I uh, checked a study about investment. 98% of all funds available here in Austria invest in fossil fuels, 61% uh, in nuclear energy. So it is necessary to understand this. And now before I come to my final conclusion, I want to confront you with something which is, called, which is called the green paradox. As I often over the years, and I did so many presentations and seminars at many universities and also for communities, etc. And I often heard the argument, yes, it's nice what you do, but it will not help, it will not change the world, and maybe it will even worsen. And the idea which is behind uh, this way of thinking has to be taken serious because it is the green paradox. Let's say this is the the dragon before the end of the theater play, you know, the, the ultimate danger which has to be managed. Now, what is the green paradox? It goes back uh, to Harold Totaling. He was an American economist. He died already in 73. So the thinking is, if we 
reduce our fossil fuel use, then there is less demand for oil on the world market. So the oil price is falling. Then other countries, namely emerging economies, are able to buy more oil and oil countries will of course extract more in order to maintain the same revenue. They need to sell more to have the same benefit, financial benefit. So overall more oil will be extracted and burned finally in machines, cars, planes, ships, etc. And this at the end produces more atmospheric carbon dioxide. So when you read this, you might first think, oh, are we crazy? It's all in vain. If I reduce car travel, if I reduce, it's all in vain as somebody else will buy the oil and maybe they will buy even more. So there is no solution for our climate problem and for our global uh, problem. Don't believe that, you know? It does not need that these countries need to sell, but it is important that we learn from this mechanism that our economy is wrong because our free global economy allows still an endless selling of oil. We have no binding elements, despite of Paris Agreement. We urgently, urgently need agreements that less oil is extracted everywhere. And we need a plan that year by year, the oil extraction goes down. So can we have an influence of that? Of course we can by divesting. If nobody buys, uh, uh, shares of oil companies, uh, then the, uh, this economy has to slow down and has to be substituted by a more sustainable uh, economy, which is to able to bring us uh, into a future for all people. So I hope I could explain this. It is a serious problem, but if we follow this guideline of thinking, the consequence would be, well, then it is better if we burn more oil, as then other countries can buy less oil. Yeah, but this is the wrong way of thinking. We have to think out of the box, out of our traditional economic thinking as this neoliberal economy cannot solve these problems. We need other guidelines, but of course we have to reduce fossil fuel use as fast as possible. Now, a comparison of uh, triple benefit principle and carbon tax. Of course, triple benefit principle is voluntary. It is an intentional behavioral change it has strong positive health effects, zero net cost for individual, as I demonstrated you. Best choice as long as there is no carbon tax. Best preparation for a carbon tax, because you have already learned how to save the necessary money and you have even invested it if you practice triple benefit principle. And it is even useful after carbon tax. I will come to that back. On the other hand, a carbon tax is urgently necessary. It would be mandatory as a law, so everybody has to pay. But it has limited behavioral change through legal order. Health effects may occur but are not granted. In triple benefit principle, you plan your behavior and you have the health effects on all three levels. And the tax cost may be a problem for unprepared individuals. You know, nobody will voluntarily say, I want to pay more tax. Everybody wants to pay less tax. So here also we have to think out of the box to understand what is necessary for our survival. And the compensation cost, and we have possible rebound effects in carbon tax. So these are some 
differences. You may rethink it. But I tell you four reasons for triple benefit principle, even after the implementation of a carbon tax. I hope we will soon have a carbon tax in Austria. Other European countries have it also, although according to my opinion, it's too low. If you have learned to practice triple benefit principle as an individual or even as a small entrepreneur, when I was as a family physician, you know, I also had four employed people. You know that carbon tax is affordable. A part of your savings is used to pay tax, but you have even more money uh, from a reduced footprint. Carbon and energy tax alone do not guarantee full health benefit. Therefore, it makes sense to continue triple benefit principle even after the implementation of a carbon tax. Carbon tax alone still allow affluent people to cause high amounts of greenhouse gas. So this is a question of climate justice and I'm convinced that carbon tax alone is not the only necessary political instrument for transformation. While practicing triple benefit principle, you learn to understand the need for transformation and you will more likely accept the carbon tax because you understand the need. So I come to my conclusions of this presentation. I state triple benefit principle has still an enormous potential. Triple benefit principle does not have the problem of the Norwegian trap, what I told you about Norway. Poor people might spend savings for more urgent needs, but this means that high income people should rather contribute more. Sharing electricity provision, like I do by buying share with my savings shares at, a, uh, for instance, wind power plant or photovoltaic plants. This is better than depending from foreign investors and from oil export, import, imports, but also from foreign investors company. Information and education is a priority. We have to learn to think out of the box. Governmental action needs challenge and control. Just paying tax is not a guarantee that our governments are investing this money the right way. So a control by citizens is very important. Carbon tax is necessary and helpful, but it is not the only necessary measure for transformation. Best practice, so lowest emission standards in all products we need for our life in nutrition, in our computers, in whatever, best practice, practice, lowest emission must be standard. And this can be regulated by laws as we have to move towards a circular economy. And clear governmental and international decisions are necessary to avoid a green paradox. So I thank you very much for following me and I am very happy and glad that we had uh, people from all over the world. I know that many of you are from Asia. I saw that there are participants in this uh, webinar uh, from Philippines, from India, from Pakistan, from Palestine, from Israel, from Egypt, uh, and from many other countries. I thank you very much for your attention. Please send your critical comment. I am always ready to learn more and we still have some minutes for discussion. I give over to Laura. Hello everyone. Um, thank you for attending and please post your questions or raise your hand if that's possible. And uh, Klaus, we had one big question during your presentation, and that is if you would hand out certificates. I think I'm just going to clarify with you, because apparently it's possible to issue certificates even if you're not an academic institution. So it would just be like a confirmation. That's how I, I understand I it. I can confir confirm that somebody yes. has participated here. Uh, but uh, this uh, I am not doing from my university position, out of my university I clarified, position. Yes. This is in, I want to be independent, you know, from, uh, from everybody uh, in, in this, but of, uh, in, yeah, 
uh, send us uh, and, and I can confirm that you are participating. Yeah, I already mentioned that it's best if they send a message to the Facebook page of Triple Benefit Principle and then I can forward it and we can also put it in some kind of nice design if that's uh, better for you, but you won't get any academic points like ECTS or something. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, in another context it would be possible, but not in this webinar, yeah. Exactly. Well, yeah, we really had a lot of participants from many different parts of the world. There was also one question about the scheduling, because for some it's already very late. And so maybe we can we cannot announce yet if there will be another one or when there will be another webinar, but we will keep it in mind about the timing and the scheduling. Mm -hmm. And oh, there's another question about the topic of your presentation. Oh no, there's just a general question. I think it's about lockdown. So. The, the question was if this presentation is about how to be healthy during lockdown. No, it's it's a general it's way of issue actually of, of this presentation. Yeah. 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 So. Yeah. But then we could uh, come up with another question regarding this. So, is there some way you think uh, you can apply triple benefit principle during the lockdown or is it more difficult to practice it during lockdown or yeah, that, some advantages to that's it? That's a very good question. Yeah, thank you very much. Actually, I think society has learned a lot. Uh, what is possible uh, via teleworking, uh, uh, via uh, webinars, uh, via teleconferences during the lockdown uh, and also uh, many possibly not necessary flights have been cancelled. Uh, of course, uh, I see now uh, that uh, uh, flights are going on again. I, I do not have the illusion uh, that we can uh, avoid all flights, but I think we can reduce flight travel and car travel uh, enormously as I have demonstrated and so let's say the lockdown because of the COVID-19 virus was a chance uh, to train this uh, but it is not directly related uh, uh, to the global uh, uh, problem of uh, uh, planetary boundaries we have. Yeah. Yeah, I, th I think we, we could uh, use the time to, to learn a lot about how to meet you. Uh, I mean, I uh, go almost to every place by bicycle uh, anyway, and if it is farther away, I use bicycle and train. Uh, so that's what, what you also can do during the lockdown. What I regret a little bit that uh, some people avoid public transport and use more cars now because they do not feel safe in public transport. Uh, so this is uh, counterproductive to the reduction. Yes, that's also what I was thinking when you're going to work. Uh, it's better to go by bike if possible. <laughs> so public transport is not really an option sometimes during phases of very strict lockdown, for example. Yeah. Yes. Uh, are there other questions? In the chat, I don't see any, but maybe yeah. but I mean, What I would like to know to get as a feedback is was it understandable what, what I said, or are there any counter positions? Uh, I mean, I used to say to my students at universities always, please criticize me. I learn uh, mm -hmm. best uh, from those who criticize me. And I think we have to further develop, but I, I have learned uh, a lot. Uh, by practical personal experience. So if you have any critical comment, if you do not agree with any thesis or with any facts I presented today, please let me know. I'm very thankful uh, for all uh, these comments. So uh, what I gathered from the chat is that your talk was very informative and fantastic. That's the comments we got. And um, I think if anyone cannot think of a critical question now, but later, he or she can also use our discussion group uh, and the Facebook page. I will try to quickly post a link in the chat. 
so you can later on uh, also find this group and post your questions there one minute So here it is and yes thanks everyone for attending i think we're just in time now if there are no further questions i think we yeah, I, I just want to add so if you are more interested take time to see the full length triple benefit principle film exactly. uh, for those who speak german there is another 30 minutes video on youtube in which i explain triple benefit principle in German language and uh, there will be more information uh, via Facebook but if you enter the word triple benefit principle in any internet search machine uh, I think you will find your way uh, to this uh, information and documents. Klaus, now we have a question about the content of your presentation. It's uh, Mr. Katzmeier or Miss was wondering um, why carbon tax is only discussed uh, in terms of traffic, not so much in terms of producing goods. In his opinion, tax on goods should accord also with the expected lifetime of goods. Mm -hmm. Yes, I absolutely agree. And I criticized this several times, you know, in the media, they only speak about uh, that the fuel for our cars will be more expensive and how bad this is for the car drivers, especially for commuters. Uh, but of course, uh, uh, transport, as I showed you in the beginning, is only a part. I mean, our carbon footprint also consists of the footprint of nutrition and of other consumption and of our housing and also housing can have an enormously high footprint, especially if you have an oil heating in your house. So uh, what I, I told you that I succeeded in 1983, that the community did not put an oil heating into my house. So if everybody would have stopped, would have stopped using oil heatings, yeah? Uh, so we wouldn't have any more oil heatings in Austria, but oil heatings, have been uh, have been supported uh, by the government up till a few years ago. It's incredible. Yeah, of course. I mean, the carbon tax uh, also on agriculture. I mean, even on all greenhouse gases. As you know, uh, there is also methane and there is also uh, N2O laughing gas yeah and also this needs to be taxed if we want to have this effect very good yes yeah so no further questions as far as i can see i'm checking facebook we also have many attendees who watched via facebook from all over the world but i think uh, there are no questions either so as i said there is a Facebook group where you can discuss and also please don't forget to like uh, the Triple Benefit Principle Facebook page and to share it with anyone who might be interested and who knows when the next webinar will be just uh, uh, have a look at the page from time to time and we will update you with uh, new dates and with new information about Klaus's research and thank you very much I think we will end the webinar with that. If Klaus wants to say something, then I, I would be finished. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much again uh, for your interest. And uh, please, I'm thankful for any critical comment. And because the question about certificates came up again, please send us a message via the Facebook page, then we can issue you a confirmation or certificate if you need it. Thanks a lot. And also there's another thank you from a participant who really thinks he has learned a lot from your seminar, Klaus. And I think it was really a lot of useful information and a fantastic presentation. Thank you so much. My pleasure. And thank you and goodbye. And thank you everyone for attending. See you soon. Bye-bye.